I'm going to talk about general learning principles and how they show up in all of our interactions with the animals in our shelter so that hopefully we become uh, more cognizant of what the animal is learning and experiencing and we can modulate our own behavior to try and support good behavior in our shelter animals. So I'm going to start off with two questions that I always want people to have, whether you are uh, a dog owner, a veterinarian, a uh, shelter worker, whenever you're interacting with an animal, um, these are the questions I would like you to have. What is the animal learning from this interaction? Because they are learning all the time. And so we want to be aware of what they might be learning and is it something that we want them to learn or not? And if it's not, then we need to rethink about how we're interacting with them. The second one is what could I do better next time to make it better for the animal? And I always think about this when I'm working with my dogs for training, like, oh, I, should, I missed a reinforcement spot there, and boy, he did not like that. Um, or, you know, I set up the environment just a little bit wrong, I'm going to be, have to more, be more thoughtful about that next time. So really thinking and being sort of, you know, self-critiquing about uh, what can I do better um, and maybe set this up better for other animals in the future as well. So you know, working in shelters, that shelters are highly stressful environments. And so our animals are already in kind of this, this chronically stressed state, uh, making their days more challenging already. And we know, uh, you know, a variety of stressors are there. The social isolation, if they're kenneled alone, uh, I suspect, and, and we have some uh, tangential research to su suggest that when they're like overcrowded, that's also very stressful. So if we're doing co-housing, uh, eight dogs per kennel might not also be great welfare, but um, uh, maybe there's a way that we can give them some social interaction without inducing extra stress. Uh, certainly loss of attachment figures, if they were an owner surrendered dog, they're in an unfamiliar environment that's oftentimes unpredictable, uh, that they have people coming in and out at different times, they might be moved kennels, they might be going out for play groups, they might have another dog walking down the aisle or get kenneled with another dog. Um, we have a, they have a lack of control. Um, both of those have been shown in some old rat studies to decrease welfare. So if they change things up, changed when the lights were turned on, um, changed if the, the um, kennel was, the uh, cage that they were in were, was tilted a little bit more or anything like that, that decreased their measures of, of welfare. Of course, there's excessive noise with all of the barking that uh, <laughs> lowers the welfare of both um, staff and volunteers as well as the animals in our care. Um, all of that being yelled at by other dogs is likely pretty stressful, right? If you walk down an aisle and people are yelling at you all day, um, it might not be the best work environment. And being looked at and petted by strange people, right? Those can be aversive events, uh, having somebody just walk up and stare at you for a little bit. And especially depending on your kennel, can you move away from that? Do you have the control to escape that? Or do you just have to kind of sit there and, and try and deal with it in other ways? So knowing that our shelters are really stressful environments, I think that makes this question of how can I do better for the animals? How can I make sure my interactions are improving the animal's day rather than making them worse? even more important. And so, you know, going in there, um, you know, I think when, um, like Lisa Gunter and I think about training shelter dogs, we find that their tolerance is much lower than own dogs. They're already stressed. And so if you're doing some shaping with them or something like that, you miss one reinforcer, they're done, they're out. Um, even sometimes when we're giving just free food, if your rate drops a little bit, they've got other things, right? They're, they're kind of in that chronically stressed state and that really affects a lot of their behavior. So learning is always happening uh, for, for better or for worse. Um, and so we have to really make sure that our interactions are hopefully producing desirable behavior. Um, and so really thinking through and understanding what might this be, what might affect, uh, could this be having on my animal's behavior? Um, so I always think about that when I take my dogs hiking and they've had a great time and we go back to the car and uh, I still reinforce them for getting in the car because it's like, yeah, hiking is probably more fun than getting in the car. So I want to you know, reinforce you continuing to hop in the car as well. And I think you know, if we're really thoughtful about how we interact with them and maybe changing just some subtle things, we can improve the, their um, daily interactions, their daily experiences while they're in our care. So first off, one of the things I think we, we tend not to do as well 
is focused on what sort of behaviors we want to see in our animals. Um, owners do this as well, right? They come in complaining about all the things their animal does. They never tell you, um, especially if you're a behaviorist, all the wonderful things their dog does. They don't, they don't call you up and pay you to tell you how great their dog is. So we tend to focus on the negatives, right? They, they do stand out to us. And what I'd like us to do is start to think about, well, what, what would I like the dogs to do? Am I okay being pulled down the kennel aisle? Then okay, then <laughs> I have this rule with my parents. If you're not gonna train it, you don't get to complain about it. Um, so that, that's, that's the deal. Uh, so thinking about what we'd like in our shelter dogs, that can make us more thoughtful about um, interacting and trying to reinforce those good behaviors when we see them. So approaching humans with affiliative behavior, right? This is gonna help get them adopted. If they can come up nice loosey-goosey with soft eye contact and say hi to folks, that would be wonderful. And of course, you know, in the sheltering environment, A, because it's stressful, and B, because you sometimes get animals that have been surrounded for behavioral issues, um, that always isn't always the case. And so we can try and think about how we can use our interactions to try and increase the likelihood of that. We'd like some eye contact, right? We would like the dog to notice us and, and maybe um, check in and see what we're doing. Checking in on leash. I think this is an underrated behavior <laughs> by owners. Uh, I saw this wonderful German Shepherd in Lowe's walking along, checking in pretty nicely with the owner, uh, and it got nothing. Um, and it's like, oh, you have this beautiful behavior in a dog in a pretty busy environment, and it's getting nothing. So I hope it doesn't go away. Uh, four on the floor when we approach or enter the kennel, right? This is, I think, one of the big challenges of, of sheltering, especially for new volunteers, getting into the kennel, getting the dog safely out of the kennel. So, you know, thinking about could we put in programs that could focus on that explicitly. Allowing the collar or harness to be put on, waiting for the handler to release the dog uh, to exit the kennel or cross other thresholds, walking on a loose leash. These are probably all behaviors we'd like in our own dogs as well. Uh, returning easily to the kennel uh, rather than balking, walking past other dogs calmly, allowing petting and restraint and exams, you know, just <laughs> real simple behaviors. Um, but again, you know, we're, we're not going to get all of these, but I think if we keep them in mind of what we would like, when we see little bits of them, we can start to reinforce them and build them up. So this is one of my um, big things for folks is just to focus on the good behaviors. Again, I think we, those negative ones stand out to us. We notice the jumping, we notice the pulling, uh, and we sometimes miss the time that the dog actually turned around and, and uh, checked in with us. So these, those good behaviors are actually occurring, I think, more frequently than we acknowledge. And if we start to, again, identify them and then look for them, we can then, <clears throat> we can then reinforce them. So we want to keep in mind what we want the dog to do. That's why I gave you those list of behaviors. You can make your own list of what you would like, um, not just what you don't want the dog to do. Because this is hard for the dog, right? If I were going to train you in calculus and I wanted you to do calculus, uh, and every time you got it wrong and I told you you got it wrong, you're probably never going to learn calculus and you're really going to hate me. Um, so it'd be great if I instead actually taught you what I wanted you to do. Same thing for your dogs. Let's actually try and teach them what we want them to do rather than just saying, well, don't do that. Well, not that either. And not that either uh, as they toggle through all the wrong answers. So keeping that in mind is going to allow us to reinforce or reward that behavior when we see it because it'll be front and center in our mind. And I think this help us, helps us make better training decisions because now we're looking for the good things and when we see them, we're, we're going to have better timing about reinforcing um, and uh, a better rate of reinforcement for them. So I'm going to take a quick step back and we're going to go through our two types of learning because this is what controls how I interact with animals and the choices that I make. And you have probably heard some of these before, but uh, we'll make sure everybody's on the same page. So we're going to talk about Pavlovian conditioning this is conditioning involving reflexive behavior, so behaviors that you didn't have to learn to emit. Um, so like eye blinking, if I puffed air in your eye, you'd blink your eye. Um, if I made a loud sound, you might startle. Uh, if I put you on a roller coaster and it, you know, the gravity dropped out from under you, your heart rate and blood pressure would go up. You didn't have to learn to do that. Those are kind of uh, phylogenetically selected and um, um, you know, built in to the typical animal. We'll also take a look at operant conditioning, what we loosely call voluntary behavior. You've probably heard that term before. It's, it's non-technical, but it gives you a sense of what we're looking at. 
Although we're going to talk about these two separately, we'll kind of combine them at the end because these two occur all the time at the same time, even though we, we divide them up. And oftentimes the choices that I make about operant conditioning are based on the side effects that I'm going to get from Pavlovian conditioning. So um, these two, although I'm interested oftentimes in, in the operant side of things, um, how I train that behavior might depend on what sort of um, uh, Pavlovian side effects I might get from that. So we're going to go through the basics, like I said, then we'll come back uh, along the way. I'll give you some examples of how we, we might use these in the shelter environment, and then we'll tie them back together. So I mentioned that Pavlovian conditioning, this is for phylogenetically kind of pre-programmed responses, um, all those things that you do naturally. And we get um, what we call an unconditioned response, like that eye blink would be the unconditioned response. Unconditioned means it wasn't learned. You don't have to learn to do it. And we have an unconditioned stimulus that elicits that. The air puff is something you didn't have to learn to uh, um, eye blink to. That was kind of uh, pre-programmed. These are usually evolutionarily important behaviors, things that, you know, if you didn't get them, <laughs> you likely aren't going to survive very long and not long enough to reproduce and your genes are going to get cut from the uh, gene pool. Um, so things like um, startling and responding to um, uh, external stressors and getting ready for a fight or flight response. Uh, eye blinking, certainly if things were flying into your eye all the time and you're just staring wide open, you're going to go blind pretty quickly. Uh, salivating uh, for food so that you are going to get more uh, nutrition out of your food because you're actually starting the digestive process in your mouth. Changing in heart rate or blood pressure in response to stressors, again, kind of readying your body for what's coming next. So we have those. Those are our reflexes, but we can take our reflexes and learn to emit them to a new stimulus, and that's the Pavlovian conditioning part. So we can learn to emit these behaviors to new stimuli, things that um, you know, we didn't come out uh, responding to initially. In general, Pavlovian conditioning is hugely helpful for us. It allows the animal and us to prepare for what's coming next. So if, I, if the dog learns to salivate to the bell instead of waiting for food to be in its mouth, it's already got the salivation going by the time food comes in its mouth, it's already ready to go and digest that. Um, I don't think I have it in this one, so I'll tell you some of my favorite examples come, come from Michael Domian's work on um, uh, Japanese quail. And so he did a lot of Pavlovian conditioning with them um, with uh, reproductive responses. And one of the things he, well, I'll tell you two things he found. One is he'd give them a little um, kind of felt model uh, that was kind of the same size as another quail, but you know, nothing else about it was quail-like. He'd present that, and initially the quail's like, well, I don't know what to do with that. But then right after he presented that, he'd give these males a, a reproductive opportunity. They got to mate with a female. And he kept pairing those. Here's this little felt object. Here's a female that you get to mate with. Pretty soon we get, uh, he puts the felt item in and the bird starts <laughs> trying to copulate with that. So he's like, maybe this is where fetishes come from is, is through Pavlovian conditioning. The other thing he found when he conditioned birds that they had a reproductive opportunity cage, meaning they'd get moved to a new cage and that's where they'd meet the ladies and get, get to mate. When those birds were moved to that cage and knew they're going to mate, he compared them to birds that were put in a different cage, didn't know they're going to have a reproductive opportunity, and looked at how well they did on siring offspring. The males that were more prepared, knew that they're going to have a, a mating opportunity, were more successful. They fathered more offspring. So again, we can see how that's uh, selected evolutionarily and how beneficial this is for, for animals. Um, so I think that those are some really fun research, uh, research lines. Of course, classical conditioning, it's also called Pavlovian conditioning because Pavlov was the first to kind of describe it. He was a reproductive physiologist um, who happened to notice this behavioral phenomenon. And so he dropped his, what he got his Nobel Prize for, put it aside, and went down this behavioral path. So initially, they were giving dogs food, and the dogs would, of course, salivate. He was a, a, a physiologist and he would actually cannulate the dogs, bring the saliva, um, bring the salivary glands to the outside. He's collecting that. What they started to see was, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the other thing we have uh, in, this, in this conditioning is that initially we have some neutral stimulus, something that doesn't elicit um, salivation, like a tuning fork or a bell 
or maybe a human. But what he noticed was that pretty soon when the human experimenter walked in the room, before food is ever presented to the dog, the dog was salivating. And you likely see that now, right? You go to the refrigerator, you pull out your treat pouch, and you look over and your dog's like drooling. Um, so through that pairing, and the pairing is best done by presenting the neutral stimulus first, then presenting your unconditioned stimulus, your food, that elicits salivation. If you pair that a number of times, what we get is that the tuning fork, or the human walking in, or you touching your refrigerator, now elicits salivation without ever food being presented. We change the names to confuse people. Um, this response, the saliv salivary response, is now called a condition response because it's, uh, res it's in response to a conditioned stimulus, a stimulus that the animal has learned to respond to. So where does this come in in uh, sheltering? We have things that are called conditioned emotional responses, where we can have Pavlovian conditioning for our emotions. And this, I think, is really important. Um, and much of why I choose to train the way I do operantly is because of these side effects. Um, so once neutral stimuli can come to evoke the same emotional response as other stimuli, fear, anger, happiness. So we can learn to um, feel fear in response to things we didn't feel fear to. This occurs, of course, naturally. So Pavlovian conditioning is occurring all the time, whether we want it to or not. Um, and we, we'll go through some examples that you know, might hit home that you've been Pavlovianly conditioned by your environment. But of course, we can make conscious effort to try and train this as well. We can make concerted efforts to say, I'm gonna try and pair stimuli in this way to try and elicit a specific conditioned emotional response. So if you were on vacation and you heard a specific song, especially a new song there, um, and it was associated with your relaxation, now when you come home and you hear that song, you might feel your blood pressure drop and your heart rate go down and you feel momentarily less stressed. So that would be due to Pavlovian conditioning, that that song was associated with um, the, the nice um, uh, holiday environment. Uh, hopefully you had a good relationship with your mom, especially if she wore uh, <laughs> um, uh, the same perfume all the time. If you smelled that perfume, you might um, uh, smell happiness. If you had a different relationship with your mom, a different emotion might come out when you smell the perfume. Um, this is from you know <laughs> personal experience. Um, that sinking, anxious feeling, sweaty palms, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure when you see a cop behind you. Uh, you know, I didn't come out of the womb fearing cops behind me in the car, but after a few speeding tickets, I do, right? So I, I can just see them there. They might not even have their lights on, um, especially if they have their lights on, though, that gets even worse. Uh, then, then you feel that emotional response, and that's due to that being paired with aversive events in the past. Um, if you have a not so great boss that likes to call you into the office and chastise you, um, especially unpredictably, if they said, hey, Eric, I, I need to see you in my office, um, that might initially not elicit anything, but after a few times of being chastised, when you hear that, you might feel nervous, sweaty palms. Um, and, and so that's the Pavlovian side effects. We'll talk about the operant side effects, which is you may be trying to avoid things. <laughs> um, that would be due to Pavlovian uh, conditioning as well. So of course, our animals can have these conditioned emotional responses as well. This is where going back and thinking about, well, what kind of responses do we want our animals to have? I want my dogs to love seeing me and be excited to see me. Um, and of course, you know, like I said, this Pavlovian conditioning occurs naturally but we can also try and program it specifically. So if you touch your dog's leash, what does your dog do? Yeah, it gets excited, levitates next to you, right? It's like, ah, party time. Initially, that leash meant nothing to them, but pretty soon it's been paired with getting to go outside and smell all the smells and see the squirrels. Uh, and now that leash has, has come to be quite valuable. Um, tail wagging, prancing, um, uh, drooling when you touch your treat pouch, uh, uh, your Malinois, because we have a, a crazy Malinois, levitating when you pick up her favorite ball, it's like, ah. uh, she's excited all the time, but that's especially exciting. And of course, the nice thing here is if I'm taking them on the leash, I'm giving her the ball, 
uh, I'm giving them treats, I get associated with all those things too. So now I become a conditioned stimulus for all the good things. I have the thumbs, I can get you your balls, I can get you your food, I can be all the good things. Um, and so I want to capitalize on that. I want my animals to be around me as much as possible, which means I want to be an affiliative um, uh, stimulus and pair myself with all the things my dog wants. On the other hand, we might see conditioned emotional responses the other way, of fearful or anxious behavior. Um, your dog's ears going down and it's zipping away from you when you pull out stacks of towels. You know, it's like, uh-oh, it's bath time. Um, that's through Pavlovian conditioning. Or your dog, uh, this is what our dogs do. They're thrilled to go on a car ride, hop out of the car, really happy, walk up to the front door, take one sniff of that vet office, and then it's like, mm-mm. Um, so maybe, you know, they start trembling when it smells the vet office. Initially, that smell didn't mean anything to them, but pretty soon it comes to mean restraint, um, you know, possibly some vaccinations or blood draws, uh, and so that can become a conditioned uh, fear uh, eliciting stimulus. So we'd like to have the top ones, we'd like to avoid those bottom ones. And of course, in sheltering, the dogs, like I said, have a lot of aversive stimulation going on, right? They're getting yelled at by other dogs. We're having to do medical exams. Um, they're having to walk down aisles past dogs that are yelling at them. Um, they're having to go in kennels that they might not be thrilled about. Um, and so we might be getting some conditioned fear. And one of the things that I think it's worth remembering, it's hard to, re to recondition something. If it has now come to elicit fear, it's harder to get it to be a fun thing again than if it were remaining neutral. So what we'd like to do is take our neutral stimuli and make them great before they ever get a chance to become uh, fear conditioned. And learning can happen in one trial. And there are certain dogs I think that learn and generalize fear much faster than others. Um, and again, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but this is one of the main reasons I avoid aversives when training, um, because I don't want, um, you know, when we talk about aversives, we'll talk about positive punishers. There are many behaviors, especially in our Malinois, that I would like to decrease in frequency, um, but I don't want to do it in a way that I'm going to elicit fear that's going to become fear-based at me, uh, because fear can lead to aggression, it'll lead to avoidance uh, and escape. Um, and, and so we, we have to think about training other ways. So how do we install positive emotional responses as much as we can? I think people are getting really clever about this, right? Of uh, putting the dog in the bath and giving them some peanut butter so that hopefully um, that bath uh, predicts peanut butter. If you were to do this really nicely, what I would do is put the dog in the tub, give it peanut butter, let it back out. Put the dog in the tub, give it peanut butter, let it back out. So it gets this association of that place meaning peanut butter before it ever means mm, you're going to get wet too. So as much as we can, we want to pair everything you can think of with good things. Going back in the kennel means treats. So the kennel becomes a better environment. It's a fun environment. Um, and, and I think even having the humans going into the kennel and hanging out with them rather than taking them out to hang out with them could be a really interesting thing to look at. Does that make the kennel less aversive? Because right now, all the good things usually happen to the dog out of the kennel, right? Other than getting fed. Humans mean treats, play, petting, so does restraint. And we want to minimize our aversives. So if you've assessed the dog's ability to accept handling by vets and intake, we don't need to retest it on a behavioral test. I, mentioned, I plugged Lisa Gunter's uh, behavioral assessments talk once before. You can go to see her about this. We agree on this as well. We're collecting a lot of that behavioral data every day. Um, and so we don't need to resubject, and, and we think it's useful. We don't need to necessarily resubject the dog to that behavioral test and give it another aversive event for the sake of um, our test. We can collect that data in other ways. Maybe think about how we're taking dogs in and out of the kennel. Um, if we take them out of the front of the kennel and they get yelled at by both sides, um, could we take them out of the back of the kennel? Maybe there's more space. Maybe there's not two aisleways. Depends on how your shelter is set up. Um, so again, could we minimize our aversives that they're experiencing then? Um, using treats to move dogs in and out of kennels as much as we can. Can we do a little treat trail along the way and get them out? Of course, if the dog's not taking treats, that tells you that they're probably really not doing great, right? If they're not um, low enough stress to, to eat. But again, how can we make things fun for them rather than um, putting, having to put leash pressure on them? And using small manageable play groups where you know, we're not having to come in with heavy aversives, especially these global aversives that like 
air horns or things like that that affect every dog in the group rather than just the naughty dog. And move dogs out of kennels when cleaning. I know that that's not always possible at some shelters, and some shelters don't do this, that they clean while the dog's in there. You can imagine that that's fairly stressful for the dog, knowing how your dog responds to a bath. Um, being trapped in a kennel while it's being sprayed down is probably uh, quite aversive as well. So again, going back to our first question, what's the dog learning from our interaction? These are things we'd love. What does the dog learn when humans walk by and dog gets treats? Gets treats? Humans are good, right? They're treat dispensers. Uh, being taken out of the kennel means it's going for a walk. Uh, it's going to enjoy going out of the kennel. Um, going into a playgroup means it's paired with an appropriate companion. Uh, it's probably going to find that more fun, and you'll see some approach behaviors there instead of avoidance. Uh, being restrained means it gets treats. Hopefully that means restraint becomes a little less aversive. And of course, we want to work our restraint up gradually, not just go in whole hog. On the other hand, if um, the kennel techs move the dogs to the outside kennel by spraying with water, what do you think they're learning? Kennel techs are scary, they do scary things. That, of course, for some dogs might generalize beyond kennel techs. We were at one shelter where uh, some dogs had particular aggressive behavior towards the kennel techs and kennel techs only. So that, I think that's something where we're like, we need to check your husbandry, your uh, handling and husbandry practices, right, if the dogs are feeling that way. If being taken out of the kennel only means it's going to the vet, it's probably not going to want to come out of the kennel. We get that with some of the horses that we work with that only uh, come out to get used in uh, palpation labs at the vet school. And it's like, mm, guess who doesn't want to be caught in the, in the pasture anymore? If the dog goes into playgroups and they get bullied um, or attacked, this is why we want nice, manageable, well-matched playgroups. They're also not going to want to go into playgroups anymore. They might um, have conditioned fear to dogs in general. Um, or as I mentioned, if the dogs are playing nicely, but another dog is naughty, so you, you sound an air horn. We have seen this, uh, that they're bringing a shy dog in, trying to get them acclimated through playgroups, which I think is a great idea if it's a well-matched playgroup. But they brought it in with kind of a naughty dog, and the naughty dog got in trouble, and so they, they sounded an air horn. That poor little scared dog just flattened out and was done, right? And so now you've ruined your possible tool of using other dogs outside to be a, um, a support mechanism for that dog. Um, one, of my, one of my grad students had this experience. Um, she, was, uh, she does a, a lot of um, fun training with her dog and she had, um, I can't remember what training they were doing, but oh, it was, I think for Canine Good Citizen. And she's a positive reinforcement trainer. She had a little pity there, giving lots of treats. This other person had a German Shepherd who was a very nice Shepherd. I'm a Shepherd fan, I'm a Shepherd owner, and I know there's some sketchy Shepherds out there. And so we want to reinforce all the friendly good behavior in German Shepherds that we see. And this Shepherd sniffed her really nicely and the, got a huge leash correction, hit the ground. I thought, well, there you've ruined your good Shepherd, right? Now the Shepherd thinks, other people approaching me are scary things, and with shepherds, you're probably going to get some pretty on-leash reactive, ugly behavior. Um, so in terms of like behavior issues, I'd much, much rather have a dog that sniffs people nicely than a dog that's now fearful and maybe aggressive towards people. So again, thinking about all those behaviors, what are they learning, and can we change our processes at all to improve their behavior? So let's touch now on operant behavior, and then we'll tie that back in with, with Pavlovian. So we have um, several types of consequences. Of course, reinforcers increase the future probability of responses they follow. They make things more likely. Punishers reduce that probability. Make, they make them less likely. And within that, we have two types, positive and negative reinforcers and punishers. Um, they and sorry, the Mac to PC jumbles up my my <laughs> text over there. Um, the positive and negative are, are poorly named. Uh, they don't mean good and bad. They mean addition or, or subtraction like they do in math. So positive means something was added to the environment, like I gave a treat or I yelled at the dog. I introduced something new to the environment. Um, negative is, re is removing something. Um, maybe you're, you're uh, you know, we're pushing on the dog's rear end, remove our hand. We've removed the hand. If that hand removal is a reinforcer, they'll sit more frequently. Um, if you're a parent or when you're a child, your parents probably tried this, taking something away from you, 
uh, putting you in a room in timeout, taking your phone away, your computer away. Um, they were attempting to use negative punishment, may or may not have worked. Uh, that's a different, different issue. Uh, but removing something um, uh, that's desirable could be negative punishment. And we'll go through a few examples. So if contingent on your dog making eye contact with you, you give your dog a treat. In the future, your dog makes more eye contact with you. We know the rate has increased, so we're talking about reinforcement. We've added something new to the environment, the treat, so it's positive reinforcement. If you put pressure on your dog's rear end and contingent upon it sitting, you remove the pressure of your hand. In the future, your dog sits more often. This would be negative reinforcement. Again, we know it's reinforcement because the rate increased, but now you're removing a stimulus, the pressure from your hand. You've taken it away contingent on their sitting. On the other hand, and I don't recommend this, but it's an example, um, contingent on your dog barking at your house guest, you throw a shake can of coins near him. In the future, the dog doesn't bark as much at house guests. If that decreases the rate of behavior, we know it's a punisher. We've added something new in the environment. We've thrown the shake can, which means it's a positive punisher. And uh, contingent on your dog being a bully at the dog park, you remove your dog from the park and play opportunities for 30 seconds. And in the future, your dog is less likely to engage in bullying behaviors. Because we've reduced the rate, we know we're talking about punishment. And here we've removed something from them. In fact, we've removed them from the environment, the fun environment. Um, this, this has to, you know, you have to be careful on why your dog's doing this because if your dog is being naughty to get away from the other dogs, you taking them out of the, out of the um, uh, dog park is gonna be a negative reinforcer, but your dog probably shouldn't be there anyway if they're really uncomfortable. Um, so those are our four quadrants. And to figure out what you're working with, you can ask two questions. How does the consequence affect the future probability of that response? Is it making it more likely than its reinforcement? If it's making it less likely, it's punishment. Once you know that, you can ask whether a stimulus was added or removed. If it were added, we're talking about positive reinforcement or positive punishment. If removed, negative reinforcement and negative punishment. The thing I'll mention here is that consequences are defined functionally. So if you hear somebody that says, I used positive reinforcement and it didn't work, that's not, not true. Uh, positive reinforcement is a relationship. So we define it relationship, a uh, relationship between the stimulus and the response. So what they found is that what they were using was not a positive reinforcer, um, but positive reinforcement works because it, it is by definition that relationship that it increases the future likelihood of the behavior that preceded it. So reinforcers and punishers are defined by their effects on behavior. You can't tell ahead of time whether it's gonna be a reinforcer or punisher. And in fact, humans have some weird reinforcers and punishers. Um, things that you think might be reinforcing could be punishing. Sometimes you smile at somebody. If they're really shy, that might be punishing. Um, uh, other folks uh, might find pain reinforcing, so we can get some weird, uh, weird relationships there. So any stimulus can be a reinforcer or punisher. It's like I said, it, it varies by individual and your learner decides. So I don't get to decide that my dogs like Charlie bears. If they don't like Charlie bears, then it's not a reinforcer. Um, so we have to observe behavior to know whether we're working with a reinforcer or just throwing stuff at them that they don't care about. If you were to try and reinforce a certain behavior in me using chocolate, you'd probably be fairly successful. Um, it's, it's a good reinforcer. Um, if you were to use uh, Brussels sprouts, not only is that not a reinforcer, it's probably a punisher. Um, and I know people tell me you just haven't had them cook the right way. Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think that's a hard ask. Um, but the functions also might change. So just because you've identified these doesn't mean that it's forever and always, right? If you starved me, I would eat Brussels sprouts and, um, and they would function as a reinforcer for me. But uh, when I have my, ch my choice of food, I will not opt for them. So how do we make our consequences most effective? And you know, some of the things I think of, um, I was thinking of my, my parents who are both very lovely. My mom's actually a good trainer, um, but she's fighting my dad who um, is not. <laughs> so all of her good work goes down the drain. Um, and, and I just tell them like, as long as you're consistent, the dogs really, to their credit, figure out, figure out what we're doing. And I think that goes a long way. If you can have consistent rules, consistent consequences, when this happens, that's gonna happen. When that happens, this is gonna happen. The dogs really actually fall in line pretty well. 
They learn, they learn our patterns really nicely. So to make our consequences most effective, we want to have uh, uh, quick timing. So if your dog looked up nicely at you in Lowe's and then three minutes later, you toss him a treat, he's going to have no idea that it was because they looked at you. That actually goes for even a few seconds, right? So the dog looks at you, looks away, uh, stares at another dog, and then you reinforce. That might be just three seconds later, but now they don't know it's because they looked at you. They're like, oh, I just got reinforced for staring at that other dog. So we need to have really good timing. So along with being consistent, I think that timing is important so that they know what the consequences are. Ideally, it's contingent upon the behavior. So when you see the behavior, that, that consequence happens. And one of the big things is our, our uh, consequences, and I'm really going to focus on reinforcers because that's what I'd like you to use, positive reinforcers, um, large enough magnitude and high enough quality to be valuable to the animal. And that might change. You might be able to train with kibble at home, but if you're taking your dog to a farmer's market, kibble might not cut it. You've got so many other environmental reinforcers out there, you need to up your game. So if we see, and I think this is really useful because we, we do tend to turn to food a lot for positive reinforcement training. It's easy to deliver. It's usually very valuable to our dogs. We can get a lot of repetitions. So I absolutely train that way. But I want you to think about a, a, a broader view of behavior, what maintains it, so that you also have a broader view of all the possible consequences that might be affecting the dog's behavior in front of you. And we call this the function of behavior. What does the behavior get for the animal? Why are they doing it? And really, from a behavior analytic standpoint, we're asking what's the reinforcer? What's maintaining that behavior? So if a behavior is occurring and it's not a reflex, it's not a, a reflexive behavior, there is a maintaining reinforcer. It might not be every time. It might be on some weird schedule of reinforcement. It might be really subtle. Um, it might be some of the really subtle ones are like avoidance of pain or things like that. Um, so those can be really subtle. And, and I have people that I'll be doing a training demo with my dog uh, using food and she'll say, this one, one student came up and said, I have a friend who has a bloodhound. He doesn't need to use food. That dog just does it. I'm like, there's a reinforcer there. <laughs> it's just that that dog has been trained with aversives and is now avoiding having an aversive applied. So um, it's not like your dog is magical and is not sensitive to non-reinforcement. There are a number of functions of behavior, and we can categorize them in some large categories. One is attention, getting interaction from humans. And of course, that doesn't always mean social positive interaction, right? Like, oh, you're a good boy. We see that with some of our own dogs, right? The, dog jumps up and the owner pushes him away and is like, no, stop. And the dog's like, that was fun. Um, so uh, what the dog experiences and what the human wants might be two different things. Access to tangible items, so getting, uh, getting their favorite toys uh, or activities, blasting out the front door so they can go chase that squirrel. Um, we have a lot of, um, our dogs have a lot of uh, desirable activities that, are, that serve as reinforcers. Um, can you think of some other activities that your dogs find reinforcing? Tricks. Tricks? Okay, what else? Good yes, if it's been paired with good things, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we get a lot of conditioned reinforcers in there of like hearing the can opener. Um, you, uh, we have some other data I'm not presenting that uh, you as the owner are a reinforcer, which is always nice um, for your dogs. They work to be with you, not surprisingly. Uh, probably getting the leash put on, going on walks, going on car rides, um, going on hikes, getting the sniff. All of those are probably lots of, of reinforcing activities for your dogs. In fact, I was at a talk where a zookeeper was talking and um, they were having some issue with an elephant and they were trying to solve it. And what they realized was that the elephant would do something like hit the gate. And they thought, I think they thought that the elephant was trying to escape, that the reinforcer was escaped from the enclosure. But it turns out if they watched it, it would hit the gate and then put its trunk on it and feel the vibration. And so that vibration seemed to be a reinforcer. And we have those too, right? We like to see bright lights and shiny things and we listen to music because all of, all of those things are reinforcing. Access to edible items, of course, we use that quite often with our, with our animals. Um, I think this one's especially important for our, our shelter world, escape from an aversive situation or stimulation. We engage in a lot of escape behavior too, right? Um, your boss calls you on a Saturday and you're like, not gonna answer that call. Um, <laughs> 
uh, putting off that email that you don't want to send for quite a while. So we have, we engage in a lot of escape uh, or avoidance behavior, our animals do too. And of course, knowing that our shelters are stressful situations, we need to be uh, really sensitive that a lot of their behavior there might be maintained by escape. And then another category is automatic reinforcement. The, this is reinforcement that is uh, produced as soon as the animal engages in the behavior. If this is, automatic reinforcement is really hard to disrupt. So, um, uh, folks that might like skin pick, um, that might create sensation that is, is reinforcing. And you can't say, well, I'm just not going to give you the reinforcer because the skin picking itself generates that sensation. I suspect that my shepherd with his little ball, that's all he wants is a big squeaky Kong ball in his mouth and he'll fall asleep just sort of squeaking it. That, that probably is some automatic reinforcement that he gets some, you know, uh, uh, stimulation in his mouth of feeling that squishiness of that ball. Um, I think the, the squeaky are highly preferred in our house. Um, that squeaky is probably automatically reinforcing. So squeaking it and hearing it, that's another reinforcer. So we have these kind of large categories. And one thing I want you to be aware of, again, is that consequences can be really subtle. So we have those different categories. Some of them are more obvious than others, right? The, you, if you have the dog jumping up and the owner's like, oh, you're such a good dog. You're like, well, maybe if you don't want him to jump, we're not gonna do that. But there are lots of consequences that are much more subtle than that. Um, I, I used to teach in um, Helena, Montana uh, at Carroll College, and I ran the foster dog program there. And so our students would foster dogs for the year. And so they're you know, taking these dogs out to potty in Montana winters, and they'd go out, let them go potty, and zoom back in. And so again, there's a consequence there. What, what happens? The dog goes out and urinates. As soon as it urinates, it comes back in. So the dog's learning something. And it could be learning different things, depending on what is reinforcing to the dog. So if the dog loves being outside, what they learn is, is if you learn urinate, you lose all fun activities, right? You go back in. And I'd have students that would say, she won't go. I have to walk her for half an hour now. And, and I suspect that the dog had figured out, as soon as I go, I go in. But if I delay this for a while, I can stay out here longer and get more sniffs in. On the other hand, if you've got more of a scaredy cat dog that's really unsure about being outside, you can use coming back in as the reinforcer. As long as you go, you can come back in. And so you can use the coming back in to reinforce that, that urinating outside. Dogs reacting in a kennel, so the dog's like barking and lunging when another dog walks by. I'm going to assume that having other dogs walk by is like in, in a closed space uh, where they can't escape is likely an aversive event. So what is the dog learning? I'm barking, barking, and yelling at that dog how horrible he is, and he's on his way somewhere else, right? He's being taken elsewhere, and he disappears, he moves away. What has this dog learned? That if I bark, that dog moves away. And I suspect this is what maintains barking at UPS and FedEx. Um, if, if the dogs only realized they brought the chewy boxes, I think that would change. Uh, but the dog barks at them, and they've got a job, right? They're leaving, they're going, and so them walking away had nothing to do with your dog barking. But sure enough, uh, now you have that, that behavior reinforced. Um, if the dog's tolerating restraint for an exam, uh, but then starts flailing and gets free, what has the dog learned? Being calm gets you nothing. Flailing lets you escape. So again, thinking about this, I always want this with my farrier for my horse, is that you know, they come out and pick up a leg to trim their hooves. The farrier's reinforcers, I just want to get this job done. So they do it, you know, they just want to push through. But at some point, standing on three legs for the horse is pretty awkward, and they start wobbling, and then they try and escape from it. It's like, if you set the foot down before then, <laughs> put it down while he's being good, so you reinforce the nice calm behavior, also let him get a break because it's hard to hold up 1,400 pounds on three legs, um, and then pick it back up, things would probably go, go better. So I think, you know, again, thinking about, can I, can I give this dog a break for just a little bit and reinforce them before I start that exam again, if, if we're doing sort of medical exams. So how do we choose to interact with the animals? And this is where I think we, we have to talk about that interaction between operant and Pavlovian conditioning. Positive punishment, its main effect of decreasing the rate of, of a behavior would be fine, right? There are plenty of behaviors, like I said, that we would like the decrease in our animals or partners or other folks. Um, but I don't turn to that as a first strategy, and it's actually my last strategy, um, if I use it, 
uh, because of the Pavlovian side effects. And so this is where we really have to think about all the animal uh, is learning. So with positive punishers, we're going to get escape behavior and avoidance. Uh, so they're going to try and get away from us while we're doing it and uh, avoid us if we haven't, you know, haven't wrangled them yet. And, you know, you can use, uh, th they do this with, with humans, and I think it's coming over to the dog world, in fact, in, in um, the form of um, start button behaviors that we have like a way of the, of the animal telling us they want to escape. So we do this with, with kids that um, don't have uh, uh, fully functional verbal skills um, that have learned that their way to get out of something they don't like is to aggress or something like that or hurt themselves, um, is to just give them a different response, tap this button and you can take a break. Same thing for our animals. Um, I think we don't teach them anything uh, or we don't respect them when they ask nicely. <laughs> you know, they may be like, stiffen up a little bit or show you they're uncomfortable and we're like, well, we're going to keep doing it. Um, and then they escalate. Um, so our positive punishers produce that escape and avoidance. Sometimes we're going to have to do aversive things, right? We're going to have to restrain them. We can, especially in a shelter environment, we don't have time to do all the lovely um, um, training uh, to get them to really, you know, participate in their own care through cooperative, uh, cooperative care. Um, but can we try and minimize that? If they show us a low sign, a low indication that they're uncomfortable, can we give them a break and, and reinforce that through negative reinforcement? So with those positive punishers, they produce escape and avoidance behavior, which I don't want in my companion animals. I want them to hang out with me all the time. So I don't want them escaping or avoiding me. And it also produces fear conditioning and, and all of that, um, that escape behavior could be aggressive, right? That could be aggression that we're getting there. On the other hand, positive reinforcers increase the rate of behavior on an operant sense. But why I choose to use them especially is that they produce positive CERs, right? When, I, when my animal sees me, they're excited to see me. When I pull out their training gear, they're excited to train. Um, and so I want them to be excited about all the things we're doing. And so I opt then to train as much as I can in the positive reinforcement realm, mainly because of, of that Pavlovian side effects. Um, there are ways of decreasing undesirable behavior without using punishment at all. Um, I have other talks, entire talks on that. Uh, but when I would do group training and we talk about installing new behaviors and reinforcing them, people would always come up and say, you still haven't told me how to get them to quit doing X, right? They really want to know how to nail down and get rid of that one behavior. And I was just not being clear enough about our reinforcement strategies as a way to actually deal with that behavior without actually ever punishing it. So uh, just a few things to know that we find that food and human interaction are two of the most important interactions for dogs. Um, and this is, uh, you know, we've studied this in shelter dogs and own dogs. Um, we've done preference studies. This is where that comes from. Uh, but we also know in the welfare world that so human social interaction is one of the best ways to improve shelter dog welfare. So knowing that these are important, positive interactions for our dogs, um, I don't think we should be afraid of, of using food um, to form a bond with the dog. Uh, I think people do actually a really nice job of trying to use food to create positive associations with humans, especially with these, these more scared dogs. <coughs> um, I always find that some of our trainers, or some of our volunteers are a little um, uh, tight with their treats. <laughs> and I'd like them to use them more freely. Like they want the dog to do something first. I was like, how about just give the dog that treat because it's having a rough day. It's in a shelter and you're getting some Pavlovian conditioning that you're making you fun and humans fun. Uh, what we found is that human interaction is especially important for shelter dogs. When you've compared shelter to own dogs, uh, we find that, that shelter dogs are much more likely to prefer petting than owned dogs. If we put owned dogs in, in stressful situations, like a novel room, then they'll prefer it uh, to food. But we actually find um, some of our shelter dogs preferred petting over food, even when food is just freely given. So I think that really speaks to um, their, their state. We know that petting reduces cortisol, increases dopamine and oxytocin, so that might be kind of helping them settle down. Um, and 30 minutes of interaction improves the dog's affect, their emotional well-being. 
recent, more recent studies that I didn't cite here have 15 or 20 minutes showing um, behavioral and physiological impacts for dogs. Um, and I really like Sue Sternberg talking about the importance of dogs having an alliance, and I think that's important for our shelter dogs. Having some regular folks, um, whether it's a regular volunteer, regular staff member that's kind of checking on them that they can kind of interact with regularly, try and give them a little bit more predictability in their life, and also form some nice uh, relation, positive relationships. So food and human interaction are two that I would use a lot with my shelter dogs. Um, uh, I would give them quite freely if I were you. Uh, but like I said, there are lots of other reinforcers we can use on a daily basis. Um, so can we use our, when we use enrichment delivery to reinforce good behavior? Can we ask for quiet or a sit before we give it to them? Um, getting to go outside, you know, we, we typically have the shelter dogs that blast out of the kennel, right? Could we try and install, maybe using food initially, some nice leash behavior, and then work up to um, nice leash behavior, nice sitting and waiting at the door being maintained by, if you sit and wait at the door nicely, the kennel door opens and you get to go out. Um, getting to go play, you approaching the kennel might be a reinforcer because you predict all the good things. Um, if your dog's jumping and barking at you and you put your hand on the, on the kennel, um, that might be a condition reinforcer. That might mean, oh, she's gonna open the kennel, touching the kennel, uh, touching the leash, opening the kennel, going in the kennel, all those things unfortunately might be reinforcers, right? So we have to be really careful about what we're reinforcing. Um, one of the things is that you might not be able to ask for everything. I'm not gonna put the dog um, that is jumping and barking and say, well, I'm gonna wait for you to be totally calm before I do anything, right? I'm gonna have to shape, I'm gonna have to pick little things like, oh, you're on the floor for a second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in really quickly. I might not be able to work up to being able to approach the kennel, touch it, open it, put on the harness all in one go. But I might work on, I'm gonna go, I know I'm reinforcing your naughty behavior by going in while you're jumping and barking, um, but I'm gonna just work on harnessing. And when you're calm, I'll put the harness on and we'll go out. And then maybe I'll work back to, okay, well now you have to be calm when I uh, am gonna open and, and enter the kennel as well as being calm when I put the, the harness on. Letting the dog sniff, uh, I suspect is a reinforcer for a lot of our dogs, getting to greet or play with another dog as long as this dog enjoys other dogs. So there are lots of reinforcers uh, we can use. Um, and I'll just wrap up quickly. I always put too much in here. Um, our main goals for our interaction is to use as many positive interactions as possible. And I think it's fine. We, we'd love for people to just stop and pet the dog. Even if they're just moving the dog to another kennel, just stop and say hi to that dog, form a little bit of a bond, a little alliance with them, say hi to them um, before moving them on. Um, and I think that makes humans important for them and provides a source of comfort. We know they're stressed and the petting can help, help reduce that. Um, and then again, minimize aversives as much as possible. So think about dog placement in the shelter. Um, how can we make sure that, that this dog is experiencing the least amount of, of stress? I've seen some shelters uh, doing really great things of telling volunteers which door to go out of, because sometimes the volunteers would take the long way, <laughs> right? And take the dog past all the other dogs, uh, but saying this kennel, the fastest way is out that way. This kennel, the fastest way is out over here. Um, potentially using visual barriers, although I, I think we don't have enough studies about the effects of visual barriers to know potential side effects of dogs jumping up. Does it actually decrease reactivity? Uh, but I think especially for, for scared dogs, uh, I would certainly use that. Um, and not using fear or intimidation or force to get the behavior you want. Um, and I know we're working in shelter environments that are limited in time, limited in resources, and sometimes it's like, I just gotta get this done. But maybe just taking an extra moment to pet the dog, settle down, um, and, and see if you can get them to do it a little more compliantly. All right, well, thank you very much. And I think it's lunchtime, so that's, that's happy news. <laughs>